Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. I first encountered the remarkable Trevor Nunn at the New College of Humanities in London, where we were both visiting lecturers. Trevor attended my classes during which he asked the most incisive questions of everyone. Sir Trevor Nunn is one of the most accomplished theatre directors alive. Among his many positions, he served as artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Royal National Theatre, and may be the first director since Shakespeare to direct all of Shakespeare's works. His unique insights into the man and his life made for a remarkable conversation. But Trevor's talents and interests go way beyond Shakespeare. For instance, he brought the original Cats production and Les Miserables to Broadway, for which he won two of his four Tony Awards. Because of his broad literary and musical interests, our discussion, at his home in London, was equally broad. It ranged over a very personal discussion of how a single teacher can change a child's life, to what excites him about literature and performance, and finally, what insights theatre can provide for understanding our modern world. Overall, this was a fascinating conversation with a cultural icon who was intrigued by all aspects of the world, including science, exemplifying how science need not be a threat to the humanities, but rather can enhance our understanding and enjoyment of all these disciplines. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program and all our programs immediately upon their release at patreon.com slash originspodcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Trevor, thanks for welcoming us here to uh, your quarters here, and it's it's, uh, it's it's great to be here. But let me let me start with a question I've never asked you: uh, Why Shakespeare? That's a very very big question. Well, it's, and uh, that involves um, uh, a considerable part of my early life story. Um, uh, I had no knowledge of anything to do with William Shakespeare until I was 12 years old and I went to see a school production of a play called A Midsummer Night's Dream. And so many of, we call them sixth formers, Mm -hmm. uh, who I kind of was uh, in a kind of idolatrous relationship with, you know, these wonderful guys who played for the the tennis team and mm. and the rugby team mm. and and all of that were now up there doing a play and and I I was absolutely enraptured and I began to imitate one of uh the performances mm-hmm. um it was it, it was a guy who was playing the role of bottom uh. and I thought those speeches were absolutely hilarious and um on various occasions, um, uh, my parents and my sister and I would go visit um, relatives uh, who lived on the other side of town um, for a kind of tea. Oh. And while I was there, I began my bottom impersonation. <laughs> um, great hilarity everywhere. And then my aunt said um hold on hold on i i i i I just um, i'm gonna go try and find something and she disappeared and we thought nothing of it and she was gone for i guess a half hour and she came back and she was blowing the dust off a book Uh and it was the complete works Uh of william Shakespeare shakespeare that she'd been given as a school prize Uh when she was 12 or 13 or 14 years old and had never opened it never looked at it Uh and it was in an attic (laughs) and I was presented with the complete works of William Shakespeare um you see we live in a random universe yes we do and that little random moment completely changed my life. I mean, the, 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 the various things are aided and abetted because mm-hmm. I had a wonderful English teacher, but, but by which I mean English literature sure. teacher. And he was so, so brilliant at 
um, expounding Shakespeare but making it live. Mm -hmm. um, that awful thing that I guess many students were, were so horrified by when the teacher says, just let's go round the class and read mm -hmm. the words. And there you go, that's that scene in that Shakespeare play. And it's deadly and, yeah, and sure. dreadful. And this teacher could bring it alive. He, he, he could make you understand how the language has so frequently not changed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and how those characters are entirely still recognizable. He was absolutely wonderful. And then, of course, it turned out that that teacher was the director of the school play oh. each year. So my idolatry then transferred to him. Oh, um, I was so, okay, you're uh, anticipating uh, so many questions in my mind. Okay. Um, and so... But, um, through him and and um, through then starting to see Shakespeare plays, I became absolutely passionate about the greatest of all dramatists. Well, I knew I'd heard you had a a, a, a teacher had an impact. I think for all of us, teachers have had an amazing impact. It's <clears throat> it's it's a not only underappreciated profession, uh, but I think that. Uh, T good teachers. I was going to ask about this. Good teachers, as I think, as you say, did not don't just tell you things. They help you discover things. And in the in the way he brought Shakespeare to life for you, helped you discover for yourself, right? He was a very very remarkable man. I discovered as I got to know more about him that he wrote poetry. Um, that he had written. Um, uh, a novel that he just about managed to get published, but oh. I think it probably had a readership of 10. <laughs> um, and um, he had lived through a very high ferment political era before the war when, when, when he was a student. Mm -hmm. um, so he was extraordinarily knowledgeable and articulate about um, all of the things that, that, um, are, are the background yeah. to our, our, our study. Sure. Um, and um, as I got to know him better, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I suppose I was privileged in the sense that he did slightly single me out as um, somebody um, to promote as a young actor at school mm. and somebody to talk to about the business of mm. directing plays yeah. and, and so on, to the point where um, uh, it transpired that he lived with his family in a windmill outside <laughs> town. And each weekend I would bicycle out to his windmill which was 12 miles outside wow. of town and um, he would do extra sessions oh and wow then in addition to that absolutely extraordinary i mean there, there were several of us who did it but but extraordinarily he would then take us to the village pub uh <laughs> and we would sit and smoke I mean, we, we, he would be breaking you know, all, all the, the rules, all the rules with, yeah. with us. And then he began to call us by our first names rather than our surnames. And that was unheard of. Oh, really? It's unheard of. You okay. should ever, oh. ever use somebody's first name at school. Wow. Um, so, yes, he was he was re rebellious in every way and inspirational in every yeah, way. Yeah, well, that's... Now, <clears throat> when you were talking, I, I was going to ask you not just why Shakespeare, but in some sense why directing at some point. But as you point out, he was... So was it he sort of the role model for why you might want to become a director rather than an actor? Um, that was one very, very potent uh, ingredient. But... Um, uh, in this random world, something else happened. Mm -hmm. When I was 13, I, I read a paragraph on the front page of the local newspaper, small industrial town, um, 
that said that the local professional theatre was um, seeking um, a, a local boy to play a, a, a part in, in a rather famous American play called Life with Father. Mm -hmm, um, and uh, the auditions would take place and, and take a, and I, I, I cut out that little paragraph and I didn't tell my parents and I went to the appointed place and I auditioned and there were a huge number of kids there and um, I was then asked to come back. I still didn't tell my parents and so I went back a week later. A callback we, call we, yeah. we now refer to it <laughs> yes. as and um, I was then told, we want you to play the part. So I then had to A, tell my parents, and B, negotiate with the school that I would need certain periods of time off lessons. And the headmaster was very unwilling, but eventually that wonderful English teacher persuaded and persuaded, and I was given permission. So I found myself in a rehearsal room with a group of as it transpired, absolutely brilliant young professional actors. Oh. I mean, the youngish actor playing my dad mm -hmm. was a man called Paul Eddington, who, who um, about 15 years later, became an absolute national treasure. I mean, he was mm -hmm. on television three mm -hmm. times a week in various series. And the, the, the girl playing the cousin who was visiting was an actress called Wendy Craig, and she had a giant TV success just a few <laughs> years later. And um, very amusingly, the actor playing the, 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 the vicar, the, 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 the local minister, um, was an actor called Clive Revel. And Clive went to America, became the original Fagin in Oliver oh. in, the, in, the, in the American production, went over to Los Angeles, had a film career yeah. and a, a TV. I mean, uh, wow, that's so, really a staggering <laughs> influence on a 13 year old. Yeah. So, of course, I, but at that point, only, only the theatre was, was the, the, the pathway for me. Um, uh, I, I assumed at that point that I wanted to grow up to be an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's a terrible, terrible loss to the acting profession that in the end, <laughs> I decided that shouldn't be the case. I mean, you know, we lost an Olivier there, but, but, but there you go. But so mm. was there a moment, well, was it just, again, uh, one of the random acts of the universe that led you to become a director? I know you got a scholarship to to to... Uh, after Cambridge, right? To, 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 to. Well, um, going to Cambridge once again was that English teacher who one day said, I think, I think you should go for an open scholarship. It was not the remotest possibility of my being able to, to do any such thing. I came from a little working class home. Actually, I wanted to ask about that. Let's step back before we get to okay. Cambridge. Uh, was, you came from a working class home, you had this teacher and you had this experience of being taken by taking to a play, which, uh, which was profoundly important, but the, your, the back, your family background wasn't in literature. Your father was a cabinet maker. Indeed. My dad worked at the bench. Uh, and when I was a kid in, in an absolutely enraptured way, I would go and watch him work at the bench because this little, um, Factory. Factory is too large a word. It was a, it was a workshop, a workshop place. Um, my dad and four or five other guys would make furniture, but my memory is of my dad with a plane uh, at a bench and and with a, a chisel and and um, wonderful. Just um, all of these guys concentrating on absolutely precise fit of every bit of wood into mm. every bit of wood. Um, and uh, my <clears throat> mum um, worked, uh, when she did work, um, as a seamstress. Uh. Uh, 
Um, and so through my childhood, I was very used to the b- image of my mum making clothes for us uh-huh. because what we, 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 we had very, very little money. We had total happiness. Um, <laughs> who needs money when you have an absolutely loving family? And, and we, we, we just, my, my sister and I had the most wonderful childhood immediately post-war um but they, but they weren't and with, and therefore there was no theater connection and no um n- no education connection. no real literature my, in the house my, my dad left school when he was 14 my mom left school when she was 15 uh-huh. um and and so they the, they had no knowledge of of the kinds of things that I was studying, um, they, that they were at times slightly alarmed, slightly concerned, slightly worried that I was doing things like Latin and, and French. And, <laughs> and, I was going to um, wonder. I was wondering if they wanted chemistry. to. <laughs> might be worried with literature or acting as a potential profession about the the likelihood of making a living. Were they? Were they? Did they want you to go oh, into, oh, into no, a more pro- the, co- completely, completely the opposite? You see, um, <laughs> that there is, of course, a tradition that um, middle class and and upper and aristocratic parents will mm. say to their children, "How dare you think about going into the theatre? That <laughs> awful, awful, <laughs> dreadful! No, 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 yeah. no! You mustn't do that. You must work in a bank. You uh-huh. you, you must get a proper job, and so." On. My parents were totally enthusiastic, oh, and wonderful. and because. There was just the possibility that if you did something like that, you could get out of uh. the the environment. That the, the, the risk didn't didn't um, enter their minds. Oh, just the possibility, the possibility that was you could get up and out. And then and then and then I I'd interrupt you, but that's sort of what happened in a way through at least this open scholarship. <clears throat> so that's where you were when I interrupted you. Ask about your parents, but well, the, that, your teacher had encouraged that you. That teacher said, "I think um, you should have a go," and and I felt completely unequal to that task. So that's when a lot of these extra uh, teaching sessions came in. Uh-huh. He would meet me early in the morning at. 8.30 and do some stuff ahead of school and then wow. through the lunch break while everybody else was at play mm. and then after school and then these weekend sessions. And so he he became sort of fixated on, I think this could happen. happen. Yeah. And then in order to take the open scholarship examination, mm-hmm. one has to go and stay for four, four and a half days in Cambridge. And mm. that means a rail fare and, mm. and you, you, you have to pay for the right to stay overnight and so on. There was no possibility of my parents affording that. And so my teacher said, you have to go to the headmaster and apply for some money from the poor boy's fund. Oh. And I went to the headmaster, <clears throat> and he looked at various reports of mine, and then at me, and then he said, "No, no, no. I think this is not a good idea. I, do, I think you should concentrate on your normal exams, and, and uh, I don't think we should be giving you this money." Oh. And I, I was, I was very shattered, and I left the headmaster's study. The next person to walk by was that. English teacher. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was an accident. accident. I think he was waiting. I think he came down the corridor and he then said to me, okay, is, is everything fine? I said, no. He, he refused. What? He refused? Yeah. Wait here. He pressed the buzzer. He was allowed entrance into the headmaster's study. He was away for three or four minutes. He came back out and he said, it's all right, you have the money. I said, what? What? What, what, what? what did you do? What did you say? And he said, I resigned. W- w- really? This is like a play. It is extraordinary, <laughs> isn't it? Um, he, he said to the headmaster, I resign Sorry. my position if you don't give this boy this money. So a totally fulcrum moment wow. in my life. And so, you know, no pressure. I yeah. went off to 
take the exam and beyond belief, yes, I was awarded uh, an open scholarship exhibition at um, Downing College, Cambridge. Um, In some sense, the rest is history. (laughs) Well, the rest is history because I I didn't fully realize this at the time, but um, Cambridge was the university, almost uniquely the university, that provided so many talents Mm -hmm. into the theatre business, the comedy business, Mm -hmm. uh, Footlights. There just was a tradition, yeah. the Cambridge Footlights. Yeah. Um, but there was a, um, a group, a student <clears throat> theatre group called the Cambridge Marlowe Society. Uh-huh. Big Cambridge joke because it was the group who did the Shakespeare plays. Oh, I see. <clears throat> and um, a group called the ADC, the Amateur Dramatic Club. Um, it's still called the ADC. Um, and... and um, absolutely thrilling the the, yeah. the the number of people that I, I so I found myself working with a boy called Ian McKellen <laughs> had a boy called Derek Jacobi um I, I mean you know yeah. how lucky can you get how lucky can you get yeah absolutely it's a it really is a it's, it's, well, you, it sounds like a in, a plot in for the a footlights I, there was a boy in my college who clearly wanted to do some he had a yearning to do something comedically but but he was very very uncertain and very nervous and came to me once and said do you think somebody like me could have anything to do with the theater and i said look i think you should join this group called the footlights and he auditioned and um In the end, a year later, I cast him in the Footlights Review that I was directing. And by then, he'd he'd started to um, do comedy material with another guy from a different college. And they were called John Cleese and Graham Chapman. (laughs) Um, I I mean, they were doing... Monty Python even. material uh-huh. at that time. time. They were they were so different from anybody and everybody else, and outrageous. It's amazing so. the collection. I, mean, I guess it's happened in physics too. By the way, that there's this period of ferment where you know they're great scientists, but I think they're also great because they were surrounded by others who helped push them or motivate them. And this was, you know, this, either you, uh, Mikkel, uh, Jacoby, Jacoby, uh, uh, Cleese, Chapman. I, I, I know, I know Eric Idle, who was there then too. And, and, and other people who become literature. We've talked to, to Stephen Greenblatt, who's now a, yep. a well-known Shakespeare scholar, among many other things, Indeed. who was there and told me he was in the footlights. It's a, it's just an amazing, <laughs> it's an amazing group of, uh, that, well, and, uh, and I did, so was it, Surely, the the presence of all these others must have had some other impact on you. It was extraordinarily yeah. invigorating, and I I treated my university career as a kind of weekly repertory theatre. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think I was involved in one way or another in thirty four productions 34. while I was at university. Yeah. I mean, sometimes acting, sometimes just playing a very small part, sometimes yeah. directing, um, sometimes devising and yeah. working on but i mean it was it was absolutely it's non-stop a, not, not non-stop it's amazing activity time. yeah absolutely thrilling now that was a dangerous thing to be doing because um i was studying sitting at the feet of one fr levis dr levis i don't know whether that name has come down to you but i no. mean it was a very very famous name at the time he was um the most um, potent and eccentric um, literature critic. He wrote several books like Revaluation and The Common Pursuit that, that, that sort of really changed the landscape of how we think about the English novel and how we think mm. about the great tradition of English poetry and, and so on. He was very, very extraordinary, very eccentric, mm-hmm. very demanding. And, and you were to, doing well, all these to, plays. To, to be able <laughs> to get into his group, you see, he taught at Downing College, my college, and there were just 12 of us. So not surprisingly, we were known as the disciples. <laughs> um, 
And um, we would literally sit at his feet. I mean, he he sat in a decaying horsehair armchair mm -hmm. in in um, a large room, um, and we all sat around on the coconut matting, um, uh, l l listening to mm -hmm. his very droll stories, his very sly jokes, and his extraordinary, extraordinary opinions and revelations. But I mean, he was. He was also rebellious. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, on day one, we all went into that room incredibly nervous. And he was sitting in the corner. And it was indicated we should sit down. And he was reading some pale blue papers. Um, and the silence became deafening as he went on reading, reading. And then... He threw the papers over his shoulder. What was he doing? And he looked at us and he said, well, gentlemen, that was my copy of the syllabus. You may do with yours whatever you wish. <laughs> so instantly, the very first thing, there's somebody saying, this is not about exams. This is not about towing the line. Uh -huh. This is not a about a system. This is that this is about your predilections. This is about how uh, 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 how you respond. Of course, the last people in the world you would expect to be able to understand that would be a group of actors. <laughs> um, I mean, okay. he he, okay. he, 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 he knew he him. knew that I got this passion, and, and he made he made digs in, All the in time. My, he knew my, my direction. But um, no, uh, I. I my, my misbehavior was that I should have been producing an essay, a major essay yeah. once a week yeah, and a lot sure. of written work twice sure. a week. And I, I was not achieving that. And I think he was fully aware that I was not achieving that. And amazingly, he let it go. He let it go. Now, I wonder whether to some extent, and I'm, I'm sure actors will disagree with me, but to some extent what I men, might imagine that directing is more cerebral in some sense, or at least you, at least more closer to the work of literature where, I mean, when you're, where, when you're studying literature or you're analyzing the works of authors and, 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 and of course to direct, that's exactly what you have to do in some sense, right? You have to look at the author, imagine, imagine to some extent intent and, context and so at least at least it's it seems more academic but i don't know how, is that what attracted you or is that well what? uh analysis is hugely hugely important yeah I mean, sure with a, with a, any text mm -hmm. be it a great classic text or mm -hmm. a play that lands on your doormat because mm -hmm. someone's pushed it through the front door um you read that script um you're immediately involved in in mm. analysis. You're yeah. you're you're trying to uncover meaning and purpose and structure. Of course, you are, um, and <clears throat> um, especially with um, new work, mm -hmm. you're also involved in um, th it, it through analysis. Uh, you're involved in assessments of practicality, practicality about size of cast, about um, doubling and trebling of roles, mm -hmm. about design, and therefore about budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so, so, so one kind of analysis moves you towards another. But um, <laughs> the the directorial process is uh, is only to some extent that because um the rehearsal room mm -hmm. is a place where indeed teaching goes on i mean there is the necessity frequently for director to be teacher yeah but director must be open to being taught there's so much that comes to you yeah. that you learn from so your, 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 your colleagues yeah. and therefore you're adjusting. And of course, um, you also have to be, to some extent, um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, yeah. a psychoanalyst, because you're dealing with different 
people under different kinds of pressure and and what are they concealing and what are they revealing and and how helpful are their moods to this yes. process and and so on and how insightful then of course what you're doing is discovering character and meaning together um there is a much more recent tradition of the concept production <laughs> the concept production which is directorial diktat it's sort mm. of it reaches us really via the russian theater to the east german theater so i'm going back some decades and then and then over into the rest of europe where the director can say yes um there is this famous play but what we are now concerned with is my version of this famous play and so i see it as and because i see it as this is my concept then everybody must yeah. be told you must do so so discovery is, is no longer part of it um diktat is part of it you do it like this you do yeah, it like sure, this sure. in order to fulfill my concept I, yeah. you will gather that is not a process that i'm happy yeah with. i was going to say it's clearly <clears throat> not a process i've often been interested in the in the relationship between collaboration and creativity in a variety of fields like music and and art and literature and theater compared to science because it's an interesting people don't think necessarily of science as collaborative but it is completely that with a give and take and a and the the the, the process you <clears throat> describe as as a director in fact, does remind me of the, of the best of what can happen in, in a, in, in, with graduate students as a, as a physicist, where it's, it's, of course there's teaching, but there's a tremendous amount of learning and give and take and unexpected results that come, mm. which I think is the most probably, I wonder for you as a director, I, I know as a, as a scientist, for me, the most exciting thing is the unexpected results that come of that, that I, when mm. we, I thought we were starting here and we end up over here. Mm. Similar things for you? Oh, very, very similar. And, and, I, I guess um, a number of scandalous stories that have reached us, haven't they, that, that a Nobel Prize is awarded, but actually several people were oh. very much part of the process. Well, it's often and the more, way. I mean, one person is awarded it. Yeah. And, and, you know, more, it's more recently, we know that um, uh, women scientists have had a hugely much more important role than, than has been... Um, designated in terms of awards or or, or um, fame. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, I'm I'm very very aware of the scientific collaborative process. I have a son who is a scientist who um, talks about his team constantly, and and but he, although he's very much the leader of the team, he likes to feel that he's part of a team. Well, it's and, yeah, but it's interesting you say that, because <clears throat> science is collaborative, it's built on teams, and you're right, it, although uh, it's been surprising, amazing to me how, uh, how uh, uh, certain awards have ended up going to people who are uh, nevertheless really good, even though they re represent a collaboration and they're able to do what they've been able to do because of the collaboration. They themselves are mm. really quite capable. But the interesting thing is it's similar things happen, um, if not more so, in, in theater and film, which is a culture of celebrity, after all, where in some yeah. sense awards are given, but the whole... <laughs> <laughs> for director or best actor or whatever, but but presumably it's almost exactly the same. Where that they're that they wouldn't be able to do what they did or, or without that collaboration. And it's, so there are many people who go on sun. It's kind of a necessity these days, isn't it, for anybody receiving an award for their speech yeah. to begin with? This is not for me. It's yeah. for everybody yeah. involved, yeah. and and I want to pay tribute to the whole group, the whole team, and and then that nightmare that people have at the microphone where they fear they're going to forget names. Yeah, sure, of course, And yeah. always somebody gets left yeah. out and so on. But, but of course, that is absolutely accurate that theatre, cinema, and, and in, in so many cases... Um, um, uh, m m m musical um, 
m- m- musical work is collaborative. A, a whole teams of people are, well, are yeah, involved, kind of, and one can't exist. W- w- one one achievement can't exist without the other. We seem to, have, but we do seem to live in this culture of celebrity that is is intriguing, especially intriguing. <laughs> I remember when reading in, in ancient times, ancient Rome in particular, that that that. Uh, it was a di- totally different world that the artist was separated from the art. That the, the, the people could love the art and just say, "Well, the artist was some divine, you know, divinely inspired." <laughs> but that the artist doesn't matter. It's the art. And so the playwright doesn't matter. It's the play. And we just live in different times. Although, um, mm. although, although, I think it was. Uh, I think Stephen Greenblatt was telling me in Shakespeare's time. It, he's sort of sad as a as a as a scholar, historian, uh, literary historian <laughs> that. In fact, it was that way, but that no, no one bothered to preserve many of Shakespeare's things. The plays were great, but Shakespeare himself wasn't. Wow. <laughs> now, now, Stephen Greenblatt and you, you're, you're getting onto the huge subject where, to some extent, science is now having something to do with it, which is the identity of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. And because relatively few artifacts, relatively few bits of physical evidence Mm -hmm. about Shakespeare's life and lifetime have survived. It leads people to question, well, you know, was it really him? Did somebody else do Uh, the work? Did he just cash in at at some point? Now, um, quite a lot of that is to do with English snobbery. Uh Um, It's to do with the idea that a boy who was um, who grew up in a very small town mm. and who was educated at a grammar school uh-huh. and then did not go to university and then went to London. How could he? How could he possibly have the the range and the vocabulary and the understanding, particularly when it's to do with? Um, Stories concerning nobility, concerning mm. royalty, um, mm. concerning politics, and, and so on. What those people uh, who, who argue that it would have to have been an aristocrat mm-hmm. who, who, who wrote those things, <laughs> what they never include is all the extraordinary stuff in the plays of Shakespeare, about working people, about, you know, the the Mm -hmm. the boar's head, Mm -hmm. the 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 low life in London, Mm -hmm. the drunks, um, the criminals. Um uh, again and again and again Shakespeare Shakespeare in the plays has an understanding of working people very early on, the extraordinary speech about the shepherd's life. Mm-hmm. Um, and when um, when people say, no, 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 it, it must have been the Earl of Oxford. Mm-hmm. And, and you think, okay, so how did the Earl of Oxford <laughs> get all of that info about, <laughs> uh, about um, you know, what li- life was like in the East mm-hmm. End and yeah. what life was like out in the fields and, and so on? Um uh, n- n- nobody, of course, wants to pursue that argument. And, and um, huh. of course, um, genius is inexplicable. Yeah. Um, Mozart is mm-hmm. inexplicable. I mean, mm. how could it have happened? Yeah. How can that amount of output of of absolutely non-stop genius uh-huh. occur when somebody dies at the age of 34. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's beyond explanation. It's unfathomable. Um, but what is overwhelmingly obvious is, number one, more things survive about William Shakespeare yeah. than survive about... Christopher Marlowe, or Webster, uh-huh. or Turner, uh-huh. or Middle. I, I mean, um, almost almost nothing <clears throat> um, survive about those dramatists. A bit more about Ben Jonson, but Ben Jonson was 
according to legend, a great friend of William Shakespeare. Ben Jonson was somebody who, in his work, lacerated anything and everything to do with hypocrisy mm -hmm. and to do with double standards yeah. and, uh -huh. and, and, and to do with deceit. Um, <clears throat> ben Jonson, after Shakespeare died, it's several years after Shakespeare died, two actors try to put together the works of William Shakespeare mm -hmm. in a publication that we now know as the First Folio. Uh -huh. And Ben Jonson is asked to write the foreword. Ben Jonson writes a passionate foreword in verse. So not anything tossed off in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. Written in verse, where he refers not just to Shakespeare, but to my Shakespeare. Uh. And for the first time ever in that passage, he calls Shakespeare Swan of Avon. Oh. Now, how and why would Ben Jonson, the scourge mm -hmm. of deceit, write that yeah. in the knowledge that really, really, really they were all written by the <laughs> Earl of Oxford, <laughs> whose family was a little bit embarrassed about being involved with something as low life as the theatre. <laughs> and therefore, would you mind very, very, very much? If you, I mean, it's just completely tosh. Well, okay, yeah, well, that's great. I mean, it's, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't mean to suggest that Shakespeare wasn't the author of the place, but, but, but it's but now we've now that we've dispensed with that. Well, but, but no, no, actually, there's one more, and I said that it's becoming scientific. Um, uh, very recently, um, computer science yes. is now able to assess mm -hmm. the regularity of word use yeah. and phrase use mm -hmm. in um, uh, ancient mm -hmm. documents. Yeah. And so a conclusion has been reached scientifically that the writer who overlaps in phraseology and mm. vocabulary most with the works of William Shakespeare is Francis Bacon, the essayist yes. Francis Bacon. Yes. Suddenly now there is a theory of, <laughs> ah, just a minute, Bacon wrote Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. Now, Here's the thing. When you read the essays of Bacon, mm. they are indeed linguistically um, wide-ranging. Mm -hmm. They are articulate. They are extraordinarily dry. They yeah. are extraordinarily mm. humorless. And they involve no sense whatsoever of human character and human contradiction Irony and, and, and <laughs> so on. Um, so what in the end you're left with is your instinct that you're reading something that comes from a certain kind of mind, a certain yeah. kind of person, a certain kind of observation, a certain kind of perception. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that kind, that, yeah, it's sure, this kind. Sure, yeah. Now, I don't care how much computer science tells me <laughs> that there is an overlap between one and the other. There isn't an can, overlap in the experience. Yes, there can, isn't an overlap in in the genius. Well, in fact, that's an actually an interesting issue, which which I've been thinking about, and we'll probably deal with in in various uh, discussions I want to have. Which is, and in, in, you know, to the extent that AI can be can um, can can not be programmed, but can learn that. For, for example, the, I was just thinking when you're, when you're talking, that I was just reading this week that a, that the first book written completely by a computer was produced, and it was just turgid and, and awful, which is good, should make writers feel, <clears throat> feel <throat> But the point is that there's a big difference between analyzing frequency of words or even analyzing it, and, and actually and actually having irony and humor and 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 those things so it's going to be a long time i think before we can imagine well, uh, but but uh, not but the question is will <clears throat> will that that transition be made when when art when artificial intelligence can 
can ultimately um, um, detect genius, humor, yeah. irony. And I'm, I'm, I'm insufficiently knowledgeable about artificial intelligence. I'm only sufficiently knowledgeable to be alarmed and petrified about where it might be headed, particularly when I I get the stories that, that a computer um, composed something by Bach, as mm. it were, and something by Mozart, mm. and then great um, musical experts are collected together to listen mm -hmm. and and to try to define which one was written by the real composer yeah. and which one was written by the computer, and they seem to get it wrong on a very <laughs> very regular basis. Yeah, no, I, I mean that that's that's very 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 alarming. Well, I guess it's alarming but, in one sense, but you know, only if you only if you, <clears throat> I kind of one can have that, that attitude, but at the same time. Uh, one can have the attitude, well, that means there's great potential. Maybe these these computers can eventually write music that's different and more interesting and will enhance, uh, you know, the, that may not, whether you call it better or not, sufficiently different that it will enhance the scope of what we can experience in music and indeed. maybe ultimately the literature. In, in, indeed, it could be, and it could help enormously in musical education. But there's something that I wanted to add about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> something that sets him apart. I was just talking about Ben Jonson. Mm -hmm. Jonson, as people know, wrote a play called Every Man in His Humour and then wrote a play called Every Man Out of His Humour. And so humour, humours, mm -hmm. was how Jonson um, described human nature. You were a certain type. That's the same as Commedia dell'arte. You could be a Pantaloni type. Mm -hmm. You could be a Harlequino type. Mm -hmm. You could be a young lover type. You could be a jealous husband type. You could be a miser type. Mm -hmm. Yes. Johnson writes plays about the humors. Mm -hmm. People are different types. Yeah. Shakespeare, and nobody else is doing it, writes plays about entirely three-dimensional people who are contradictory, mm -hmm. who have subtext yeah. in everything that they... And, and from very, very early on in his career, <clears throat> Shakespeare is saying what we say isn't necessarily what we mean. Mm -hmm. What we say can be because we're trying to hide something. What we say publicly isn't what we necessarily um, uh, would, would, would go for or reveal privately. Shakespeare is writing psychologically mm -hmm. several hundred years before Freud began to mm. define how psychology, psychiatry, and, what, what, what works in us. And, and, and therefore, there is no problem at all about being in a rehearsal room with a group of actors, <clears throat> contemporary actors, who want to examine a Shakespeare text for its psychological ingredients. Mm -hmm. There's no embarrassment. There is so, so much possibility. Yes. Uh, but because that that's how he observes and yeah. uh, he he observes the whole range and contradiction of human nature and, and, well and and, and uh, when i was talking to Weinblad, and of course that the 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 conceit of his last of his last book tyrant was that he'd also he also anticipates just by that when you talk about deceit that the notion of how people become tyrants successfully how a population can allow themselves to 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 serve under tyrant the notion that deceit and deception is such a key part of it is uh, is very fascinating when you think of Shakespeare. And, and, and of course, one can't help but think of the modern connections, well, in many ways with Shakespeare, but of course, deceit and deception being such a crucial part of what is now a, a great threat to democracy, or at least uh, the pos possibility that, that dem the democracies can be overwhelmed by tyrannies. It's really... Uh, well, it's, or overwhelmed by AI. <clears throat> yeah, well, maybe. And, 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 I mean, exactly. somebody has postulated already um, what astonishing use could Stalin have made mm -hmm. of sure. where we currently are with 
algorithmic oh, yeah. science and and how <clears throat> there is then the possibility that an entire population can be programmed i mean first yeah. of all because of what they watch and what they see and what they receive through their computers and their telephones but then eventually eventually through little implants um <laughs> that we can all be <sighs> programmed to behave exactly <laughs> as the great dictator demands um it is very scary i mean i i i, I was in russia at the very end of the communist era the brezhnev mm -hmm. era and i remember in moscow once walking in a park and a, a, a vast um, queue, a vast line, sort of five deep of of people, were progressing through, um, and eventually they were going to uh, walk past Lenin's tomb, mm -hmm. and I walked past this long, long, long line of five deep people. Yeah, I've been in and Lenin's tomb. It's a huge line. Nobody was speaking to anybody the, 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 it was like you were walking past zombies huh. truly truly there was no levity there was no discussion there was no murmuring there was no whispering just people shuffling forward looking straight ahead with a face of grimness and and had I have had a mobile phone mm, in you those have taken days, pictures. I would have taken <laughs> pictures, and it would have been so, so alarming that a population, that number of people, could be brought to that kind of mindless docility. Well, you know, I, I, I have to say, I think having I, I was in Russia in, in the sixties, and and um, <clears throat> and and. Uh, I, and of course, I've known many people, and, and including physicists who left Russia and wrestled with Soviet Union. I would say, uh, let me put on a rare optimistic hat because I don't have that hat very often. In two cases, related to things you said, one of the things that I think was good about in in the so former Soviet Union, everyone knew the propaganda was propaganda. Every, I mean, they saw Pravda. They knew they never believed it. They had to. They had to Pravda toe the line. The truth. Yeah, the Pravda of the truth. But they had to. They had to toe the party line for various reasons. But no one believed it. I think. And so. And it was. Uh, I unlike, challenge your word. No one. Well, okay. I, 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 I recognize many, many, many. Did okay. Not well, I guess it. many of the. <laughs> men, if there were a Shakespeare play, I think one would imagine that there'd be scenes where the the barman would be talking out back, and they'd be making fun of the nobleman, or in this case, the dictator, because in the privacy. When there was privacy, mm -hmm. I suspect there were a lot of such such discussions that Shakespeare might have picked up on. Well, it's interesting again that you mentioned Shakespeare because he did write politically. Of I mean, course, for for somebody to set up that early in his career to write a history cycle that ends up with the establishing of the Tudor dynasty. Yeah. Okay. Many scholars will say yes, and 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 um, you know the plays are in a sense simplistic in 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 declaring you know at last at last we have arrived at the great Tudor dynasty yeah, yeah. and we're still in the great Tudor dynasty and the Tudor dynasty will last forever yeah. and and so on. Actually, when you think twice about it, you realize that Shakespeare is saying, look, the pathway to the Tudor dynasty is incredibly tangled. Mm -hmm. It's full of illegitimacy, full of um, uh, ongoing um, conflicts about who had the right to sure. inherit what. Um, unquestionably, by the time you get to um, Bolingbroke mm -hmm. overturning Richard II, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I mean, inheritance is completely yeah. out of the window. Um, so Shakespeare is on very, very, very tricky ground. And when he writes Richard II, 
which is not not early on in his career. He's writing about a king being deposed by a, 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 partly a noble but partly a populist mm-hmm. movement. I mean, that is so dangerous for Shakespeare to be doing yeah. that at a time when Elizabeth is being mm. challenged by Mary, Queen of Scots, mm. and and mm. various other claimants mm. to, to to the throne. Um, and Shakespeare follows it through and has Richard II dethroned in mm. a prison. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and eventually, eventually, Richard II sort of discovering a, a kind of humanity and insight that he never had before mm-hmm. um throughout history either in satire or or fiction uh, you can hide political commentary with a little safety just like you can in science fiction you can include things that you could never <clears throat> uh, the first interracial kiss was in star trek for example that, that you can embed in a the, the political commentary in fiction in a way that presumably is safer than just writing the commentary much safer i guess even in that time <laughs> Yeah, I'd absolutely take your point. I mean, Shakespeare was writing history plays where, to some extent, he's saying, look, these are documentaries. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah. folks, the, 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 this is what happened. There's a, the, there's a sort of dangerous element of that. But, yes, I, I, I absolutely. I mean, there's a lot um, of tradition. Science fiction, science fiction so, so excitingly takes us to or so I, I mean, the science fiction of twenty five years ago mm. is already coming true. Well, some of it, it is some of it. I I actually think having written <clears throat> about science fiction, I think that the thing about, most remarkable thing about science fiction is that it misses the most important developments. No, very few people talk about the internet. They talk about flying cars now, and which we don't have, but no one point you know point very Watch few people. Watch the space. Yeah, yeah. So I think that what the wonderful <clears throat> thing about the real world, and I do think, is that it's stranger than fiction, and that that that. Uh, that we can, with our imaginations, imagine a future, and it's and and there'll be some things that will match, but the most important things are things we well, never anticipate. That's why, as a scientist, by the way, that's why I do science, right? If we knew, it, because if we knew it was going to happen, it wouldn't be so interesting. I think as, as, but, as the fact that the discoveries are change everything. Yeah, but and and of course, no one scientist or no group of scientists can have an influence on what to promote and what to freeze, Mm. what's good for us and what's not, because everything moves forward down inexorable pathways all all, all the time. We have to find out more, develop more, take it Mm. further. But there is a growing question, isn't there, Um, which is a moral question rather than a scientific one. I mean... um, If we acknowledge Mm -hmm. now, I mean, I've mentioned this to you before, but if we acknowledge now that science could take us to a world where virtually nobody has a job, Mm -hmm. nobody has a function, therefore it is necessary for of the world's population to be sedated and to be told what to do and to be provided with entertainment. And then, <clears throat> as science says, and you can live to the age of 150, mm. or, no, actually the age of 200, actually we're just at the point of eliminating death. You can live um, eternally. Um, we have the the possibility, maybe even the probability, of a vast species population that have been transformed into numbers, into morons, into well, the- into a kind of nothingness, to the point where Aldous Huxley, Brave yeah. New World could be coming true, an entire population sedated and just hanging around looking at screens. Well, the po- you know, the possibilities of the future are terrifying. That's why, that, and they're also exhilarating. And that's why life is, in my mind, worth living. It could be, it could be un- I remember, I, I've given some commencement addresses and I always wanted to begin one with a commencement address I read and it's been unattributed. Some people think Kurt Vonnegut, but he says no, where he began by saying, 
things are going to get unimaginably worse and they're never, ever going to get better again. I thought, what a wonderful way to greet a grad student class. Like, what a gift to me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think the point is that, well, that may be true, but it doesn't have to be the true. Nothing is written and, and it could be. And there are, <clears throat> there are terrifying <clears throat> possibilities. I, I can, uh, an alternative ver- version of that, which is, which uh, I first heard espoused by the economist Jeffrey Sachs, but but referring to way Keynes, uh, the economist Keynes talked about the industrial revolution and machines, as you know, clearly it could take people's jobs away, but and and there's no doubt that AI will replace most jobs. But so that could lead to an, a, a miserable world, but it could also lead to a world where 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 the jo- where we're free to spend to spend our time in coffee houses talking about Shakespeare, listening to music, and doing the things we want to do. So there are lots of I, if, look, a, if anybody said to me that that we're in a world of AI and we can create all our own plays, all our mm-hmm. own drama, all mm-hmm. our own movies, and honestly, you're absolutely fine. You can sit in a chair and talk mm-hmm. about Shakespeare. I I mean, of course, I would blow my brains out. I mean, <laughs> um, because uh, if if one's aware of those thrilling possibilities of work and interconnection with other people. You never, never, never want to w- w- want to lose them. But I well, do, I I, I do sometimes fantasize, and I know that I'm in a territory of science fiction, but but um you know the the the, the world tried to come together with this notion of the United Nations that that um, representatives of countries or all mm. of it can get together and and can try to establish world peace can t- can try to um mm-hmm. uh, somehow control wild behavior mm-hmm. and and disallow um unfairness between nations and so on and it's had a very checkered history we're not we're not good at taking moral decisions oh, I, I'm not on behalf of the rest of us oh, yeah. but i i kind of dream that we need we need to go one stage further now than the united nations we need to have um and and this sounds very scary we need to have a small group of wonderfully wonderfully enlightened minds who are allowed to make the moral judgments about the future and to say, yes, it is fascinating, <laughs> this kind of science, but actually we're now going to put a stop to that oh, well, because it is going to turn us all dictators. into morons. And this kind of science, yeah, you're, you're not allowed to develop nuclear bombs anymore. Well, uh, I mean, we've already been there. Yeah. I just made a film about it. Mm-hmm. But... Um, um, uh, 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 is there is there a need for some kind of moral uh, 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 override? Um, and I know I'm getting very, very close to religion, some yeah. sort of godlike group <laughs> who will say this is allowed and this is not well, allowed. I think you're, no. But I fear we're going to need it. Well, you know, I mean, you're not the first, right? It, 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 and the want, desire for enlightened dictators goes back to Plato or before. Uh, I think that that um, then, but I, I guess I'm less ho- hopeful that that an in, because I think the most exciting things that happen are unforeseen. I think a group of people trying to imagine a future <clears throat> just will inevitably get wrong, no matter how smart or talented they are. Moreover, again, I'll take the not the devil's advocate, but the optimist's advocate in this case, just for fun. I th- every uh, everything you discussed is possible. I also think, though, that that through developments, including AI, we could imagine a future that's just different. It may be, there's no doubt mm. being human will be different, but it doesn't always mean it's worse. Let me give you an if example. If that of, small enlightened group are guiding it. Well, maybe AI. <laughs> maybe AI are the, is the one who should guide it. Because okay. but that may be, that's certainly, and in fact, I suspect that will be the future, but but whether whether it's for better or worse. But let me give you an example that, that goes back to storytelling, and then maybe we'll get to, to something you just touched on. That, that is that at the time in ancient Greece, when, when writing was first being incorporated generally, Plato and others decried it and said that it will be the end of storytelling because storytelling <laughs> is, was, requires an oral tradition, which requires memory and people won't have memories. And the whole idea of stories will just be go out the window mm. if you can write them down. Mm. And of course, if without writing, we wouldn't have had Shakespeare, or at least you and I wouldn't have had Shakespeare. And so I suspect that 
that we can imagine a miserable future that isn't so miserable. It's just different. So let's, but let's 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 move to. Well, we could debate that all day we, long. We, uh, well, okay. Yes, but let, let's go back. That. But you you said you were beginning to be well. Some of the things you said about Shakespeare, and then this this question of being almost religious or biblical. The fact that Shakespeare understood humanity. There's a quote from you that I that I want to um, um, uh, that I like. Uh, you, when you said that Shakespeare was your religion, and you said hmm. Shakespeare has more wisdom and insight about our lives about how to live and how not to live, how to forgive and how to understand our fellow creatures than any religious tract, 100 times more than the Bible. I'm sorry to say that, but over and over again in the plays, there's an understanding of the human condition that doesn't exist in religious books. I, I find that a Absolutely right. Although I don't see why one should be sorry to say that, <laughs> because. <Well. laughs> but um, when, so, so of course, uh, w w when I did say that, um, and and I I I meant what I said, and I stand by what I said, sure. and I'll explain. I, but I, I was, of true. course, in receipt of a torrent of abuse. Um, uh, well, I, I, I don't said know why. It. And and um, I was I I was uh, I, I I I think before I I began on that paragraph i i did say that i entirely respected um anybody and everybody's right to um believe in mm -hmm. their um religious pathway and and um <clears throat> whatever um whatever gods m m made sense to them um i i i, I was brought up going to sunday school i was therefore part of the 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 sort of church community um i became a choir boy i became a server at mm. communion i i then um uh, became qualified to take communion um i became the cross bearer i would read the lesson <laughs> we all bear um, cross <laughs> uh, and and then one day um just the contradictions of it all the yeah. impossible contradictions mm -hmm. sure that we're confronted with in religious texts just overwhelmed me to to the point where i i i, I I became um, almost convulsed, and and uh, uh, it was in the middle of a service, and and another huge contradiction had just occurred, mm -hmm. and I found myself leaving with with with, with my robes, with with my my white and black um, religious robes. I I I went to the vestry. I hung them up. I went out, got on my bike, and I, I never, I never went, went back. back. Um, and um, you, you, you really do have to close your mind mm -hmm. to endless impossible contradiction to Except. believe in, in, well, certainly in um, the Old Testament and New Testament mm -hmm faiths yeah, sure um i think it's uh, true generally but, but um i'm i've 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 wanted to find out more so i i'm not sure how many people um outside islam can say this but i have read the quran mm -hmm. from from beginning okay, to end and, yeah, and, and, and discovered how extraordinarily reflects the old testament yeah. uh in 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 all, all its early statements and then how as a, a re religious tract it's um repeatedly full of advice about what is allowed between one family and mm. another or or in in your village life or who mm. you are allowed to marry yeah. and, and and so on i mean there's a set of rules yeah. that that um is embedded in 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 the work for a particular community at a particular time mm, yeah um and so when i compare those works those tracts and i mean 
the New Testament is is full of extraordinary stories, yeah. and and some of the Old Testament um, contains mm -hmm. um, supposedly historical uh, uh, events that are yeah. fascinating. Um, uh, even so, when I consult Shakespeare almost on any random page, yeah. I will find an insight about our condition that is more complex, that is more understanding, um, that is less judgmental uh -huh. Absolutely. About, about who we are and how to attempt to live together um, uh, in, in community or indeed worldwide. Well, um, you know, let, let me jump there because I think that I want to, um, I want to have a few more questions for you that, that, that bring us in some sense from Shakespeare to today, that, that w what, given that taking that thought with Shakespeare and hopefully some playwrights today. What what can theater do in the current times? What 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 can theater accomplish in in the modern world that that you see as um, enlightening or helpful for for uh, it to uh, for us what, to at least reflect on our yeah. current circumstances? What you're asking a very very fundamental question about theater, yeah. and of course, to some extent, it applies all the way back to the Greek dramatists. Mm -hmm. It definitely applies to Shakespeare, that theatre responds to a contemporary world. Theatre takes up issues, um, moral debate, mm -hmm. political debate of the time, frequently disguised in works of history in mm -hmm. in in works that <clears throat> refer back to earlier generations mm -hmm. but um uh the the plays are saying does this ring a bell with you because isn't this to some extent what's happening now and 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 the judgments that we're making in this play do you understand that these are judgments we could or should or shouldn't be m m making now? Shakespeare is constantly referring to a, a, a contemporary world. Now, through the 19th century, the theatre became a, ever more a, a leader in how um, <clears throat> we define society. I mean... Um, there is the strict morality of 19th century Victorian society <clears throat> being challenged by Ibsen, mm -hmm. who has Nora walking out on her husband and her children mm -hmm. because she is treated as an object, not as, as a fully fledged human, human being. being and it's the first overwhelming feminist work mm -hmm. um I, I mean shakespeare wrote feministically many many mm -hmm. times yeah. and i don't by the way believe that those parts were all played by boys but that's mm. another another big 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 <laughs> question but um shock waves uh when ibsen wrote that and of course um there were censorship groups all over Europe. In this country, it was called the Lord Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. The Lord Chamberlain's office could regulate what was allowed to be seen and not. And of course, the Lord Chamberlain's office said, you can't see Ibsen's players. They are disgusting. Yeah. They are l l l loathsome. They are immoral. Strindberg then went on and did even more yeah. challenging the idea of marriage challenging male behavior but, uh, and indeed sometimes challenging female behavior but but um but um very confrontationally about society as we get into 20th century george bernard shaw is yeah. writing politically um 
r- 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 writing, uh, you know, in M- M- Major Barbara, a play about the obscenity of armaments, mm-hmm. and uh, at a time when he should be subscribing to um, the whole idea of empowering your nation with more and more w- w- weaponry. I mean. Um, Shocking, shocking. Um, Harley Granville Barker, who was a contemporary mm. of George Bernard Shaw, and I've just amazingly had the experience of doing a Harley Granville Barker play that has been discovered just recently, uh. and I did the world premiere of it last uh. year, uh. that would never, never have been given performance permission by the Lord Chamberlain. Mm. A play that's 120 years old, and we've just done it for the first <laughs> time, because it's about a woman who feels she has the right to walk out on a marriage. She has no mm. rights of divorce. Mm-hmm. She has the right to take up with another lover and not be judged by society but she is judged by society she's beyond the pale she has the right to go away with that lover and live in another country and work as an artist and then decree that that is not working out and then take another lover Mm -hmm. i mean barker is writing uh at, uh, at the turn of the century something that would never never have been given performance yeah now and yeah. at the moment as we get more and more and more up to date theater is more and more the leader of the agenda rather than responding or rebelling <clears throat> theater and to some extent cinema but i would say most of all theater mm-hmm. <clears throat> is saying you might find this outrageous but we are doing things differently and we're writing about different things more so, with more, more freedom than film that's well, cinema. maybe I, because I, the budgets I, are... I, I, I would say you know because of the certificate system to some extent is still with us and mm. films are hugely expensive and yeah. therefore you can't you can't um deliberately decide to go for a very small audience because of of or, of the, the um or certificate risk, uh, that you get confronting <clears throat> the current but, uh, moral <clears throat> yeah whatever at the moment um the agenda would be spelt a g e n d e r um i mean uh everything to do with gender Everything to do with sexual inclination is now absolutely central to the work of theatre. So, uh, I mean, you know, for for many decades past, people have bravely written about gay relationship mm-hmm. and gay rights, mm-hmm. um, and and <clears throat> and and have have won through re- re- mm-hmm. repeatedly, and 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 then that entered the cinema and and and, uh, and that now there is a, a, a absolutely no possibility that 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 people can can get away with homophobic re- yeah. reaction but um currently we are concerned with gender uh partly because of the huge influence of the Me Too Mm -hmm. movement and all of the different movements that are akin to it that um, really do demand that the woman should be at the centre of the story, should be in some way controlling or judging or defining the, 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 the story because we can't any longer subscribe to an uh, an idea of any sort of male domination, male decision making, mm. and, and 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 women being subservient to that. So, hugely, hugely plays concern that subject, but also gender in the sense of. <clears throat> defining gender cross gender um are we are we any longer satisfied that there is just male gender and female gender when we know mm-hmm. that people can be immensely uncomfortable 
being defined as one or the other, and mm. why not be defined as both, um, and and so on. Drama is beginning to present that, and a great deal of the time present that through casting. A lot of the time, roles that have always been associated with male performance are now being cast with the female performer. So just recently, I know in New York, there is my colleague Glenda, Glenda Jackson Mm -hmm. playing King Lear, but just recently in London, Richard II has been played by a woman. Hamlet has been played by a woman. Um, in Stratford, I used to run the Royal Shakespeare Company. So yeah. in Stratford, um, they are about to do, or possibly even have done, a, a production of The Taming of the Shrew, mm-hmm. in which Petruchio <laughs> is played by a woman and Kate is played yeah. by a man, so that the control is the opposite way around. Now, all of that is reflecting where we are, is leading where we are. That's all absolutely splendid and right and and, and is doing with the theatre what the theatre has always done. Every time when that has occurred, there is a swing of the pendulum. Mm-hmm. The pendulum takes takes us more and more and more to the, the this shocking or 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 um to an extreme re- 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 rebellious extreme mm. and then the pendulum begins to swing are you suggest- back are you suggest i it's think at far? the moment at the moment the pendulum is swinging very 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 far round to the uh, my, my only point being if every entertainment if every play subscribes to the same notions then audience begin to fit or are in danger of feeling that wherever they go whatever they do they're seeing the same thing mm-hmm. um and so <laughs> their yeah. visits need to be it's less time. regular you worry and, when people subscribe uh, uh, to whatever and, the current so, moral <laughs> um, uh, uh, of course of course of course we want the theater to go on challenging to be at the boundary all the time to to push push the boundary to go beyond but if the they're boundary. All, but if they're all pushing then they're no one then no one's pushing in some sense uh, uh, it's it's very very difficult at the moment to do a production of a shakespeare play um with any sense of the gender casting that Shakespeare yeah, probably yeah. had in mind when he wrote it. <clears throat> That's a fascinating question. I'd love to talk about it longer. We don't have time right now, but let, let me let me No time. No, What's no, going on? Un- unfortunately an airplane beckons. But, <laughs> but but no, but there's two there's two things I wanna I wanna touch on. But um, and we'll we can continue our conversation in in, in this regard in another way. In terms of, you, know, you hit one current area. Uh, let me just say we're living in time. We're talk, we're speaking in Britain right now, and and Brexit is happening. And and I was going to ask how you thought play, plays might reflect Brexit. And I think I, there's another there's another quote of yours I found, which is personally I think the Merchant of Venice is relevant for Brexit because it tests the character of a person who made a terrible deal and whether he will go through with that exacting. With, with exacting the terms of that contract. And so I, I gather you reflect that's exactly the dilemma that, 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 that the United Kingdom's in right now. <clears throat> well, many of the things that we have talked about touch on <clears throat> the idea of democracy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And in an increasingly AI world, what is the meaning of democracy if a population can be controlled yeah. towards one inclination or another. <clears throat> what is meant by democracy? Now, we're not at the moment in the AI world, yeah. but we are in a world where it's possible to hugely influence mm-hmm. a voting population yeah. through social media through 
Facebook contact through anything and everything that arrives on your telephone. And if one group wanting something are more sophisticated or that much more ahead of the game in how they use those techniques, they can subvert what might have been in the old days democracy into um, what, what, what we can influence a, 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 a vote frequently <clears throat> without truthful argument. Now, and you're talking, suggesting, I think, that that's, <clears throat> that's what's happened in Brexit. Well, we're, we're, we're talking about politics for centuries, yeah, aren't yeah. we? That, but that's that just people don't necessarily tell the truth. And yeah. people <clears throat> um, manage to get v- v- votes for what they stand for by all kinds of me- methodology. But um, unquestionably, what was promoted as Brexit mm-hmm. three years ago, what was promoted as this is all straightforward and it's simple and here are all the benefits to the point where millions will become mm. instantly free for mm. our own national health service yeah. and all this horror of, of uh, I- I- immigration mm. will all disappear and and we will all have all the jobs that we were... And so, um, was completely erroneous and the people who promoted it knew that it was erroneous Mm -hmm. they absolutely knew that they were influencing millions and millions of people with false information and they were also very clever at referring to any counter argument as Mm, fear-mongering um and and so um uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, 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 but people who opposed Brexit, who, who believe that it is a wonderful thing that Europe now exists where it's impossible for Europe to go to war because the last few hundred years have been the history mm. of Europe going to mm. war yeah. with each other, with each other, yeah. with each other, absolutely nonstop. Um, we must get beyond that and and share our cultures and and <clears throat> share our background and and share our enlightenment um for those of us who think that uh, to be accused that we were scaremongering it, it um, is, is, uh, is is very hard to take so um it's not surprising that the system has completely ground to a halt, democracy at the moment is incapable of resolving it because... Well, living in the United States, I have to say, I feel um, it's the it, the similarities, of course, are eerily haunting. <clears throat> do, do you, uh, let me say, uh, most, I know from having talked to scientists that, that, that many concerns about Brexit and, and Europe, but, but from an artistic perspective, just besides the harm to the potential harm to the country from an artistic perspective, from a, a theater pr- perspective, would do you see a, a, a? You're also concerned about Brexit in in that oh, sense as well. At, a, at every level, um, to do to to do with um, enlightened European funding mm-hmm. for all kinds of projects, towns, cities, um, uh, um, uh, long term projects the, the the european funding has been brilliant for so much of that and i that think will, a lot of people don't realize how much comes from Europe. oh absolutely yeah, yeah. And, and, and that will all disappear um uh, but, but <clears throat> of course what will diminish is the extent to which we share and the extent to which we exchange exactly when what we should be doing is sharing more and exchanging See, more. more it's always it's, um yeah, and is... of course, just personally, um, I love going over to France. <laughs> There's a wonderful, wonderful machine um, 
that's been invented in the 21st century <laughs> called the Eurostar. <laughs> and uh, you walk into a railway station in the middle of London, <laughs> you just pop through two little instant passport controls. It <laughs> takes you 10 minutes and you get on a train and you walk off the other end in Paris. It's you, you, it's taken you two and a quarter hours. <laughs> it's There's no sense that you cross borders. You're, you're, you're absolutely absolutely at one with all of the people in Paris, particularly this weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that is all going to change. That is all going to be, well, uh, well if, if you if are happens. British, you have to be in a passport queue and, and we're not going to hurry you up <laughs> because you've just left our European Union so you can queue for two and a half <laughs> hours and then there'll be another passport queue at the other end, and we're not sure that we recognize this passport. Mm. And, and well, as someone is, who's... It someone's, will be hell. Yeah, I guess as mm -hmm. someone, may, maybe Britain's still holding it against the United States, because as someone who goes through pass, two-hour passport queues to come into England now, I'm particularly sympathetic to that. But let's... The final question I, I, I want to ask you is, so uh, we've concentrated Shakespeare, but we... but. But we should point out that you, you're, you're, you, the, the, the range of theater that you have been involved in is immense, besides the fact the original production of Cats and Les Miserables, many things for which you've been acclaimed and won Tony Awards. What, what, uh, what haven't you done that you'd like to do? Oh gosh, that's I, mean, a big no, one. I don't want the whole list. <laughs> <laughs> that's but a very big one. one. Well, I don't, I, um, I, Two, three years ago, I would have said, uh, I, I, I want to complete doing all 37 of Shakespeare's yeah. 37 plays, and I've yeah. now done that. Me so too. I'm very, 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 very happy, happy that's a target. Um, I love developing new music theatre work, and there's a strong connection mm -hmm. between working with Shakespeare and working with music theatre, because in both cases, you're, you're, you're working with rhythmic language, mm -hmm. you're working with phrasing you're, you're you're working with whether you can afford to pause here or here you're 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 working with um making totally believable character through heightened language totally believable character through music through song mm -hmm. okay. um uh, and 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 you're doing heightened storytelling in both cases so it's no accident i mean on a number of occasions i have made one theatre company to do a musical and a Shakespeare. Oh. And they, they perform them uh, in repertoire. So one night the Shakespeare, one night the musical. And I love doing that. And yeah. I, lo I love proving that, well, I look that, forward that, to... that connection. So, yes, lots more m m m music theatre work. Um, I just um, weirdly decided that it's about time, having been involved in structuring a lot of shows and working with writers very closely on finished versions mm. of a lot of shows and having written largely by accident a number of lyrics. So I ended up writing the lyrics to a song called Memory <laughs> in Cats yeah. by accident. And I, 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 I wrote a song called On My Own in Les Miserables, <laughs> sort of by accident. Um, and that, and that, that, that's happened quite a lot. Uh, just recently, I've thought I'm going to write the book and lyrics of a, a musical. So oh. watch the space. Oh, well, I, we can't, I can't wait to see that. And I uh, hope you'll also expand into... Uh... I know you're fascinated by science too, science and theater. Oh, oh well, absolutely. I'd love to do something with you together at some point. Oh, um, yes, 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 yes. Let me, no. Uh, that, that, yeah, that was a very good cue that you've just given me <laughs> because wouldn't it be wonderful with the agenda to go one stage further and say, where can theater and science co-create i mean wouldn't that be thrilling no truly i, I agree I, I and that's that a wonderful, wonderful beginning for another especially because from where you're sitting 
you see you've got headphones on mm. and uh, you've got a beard and uh, you've got a very, very strongly receding hairline. Thank you. <laughs> I've got to tell you, occasionally you look exactly like William Shakespeare. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, that's... <laughs> beard, receding <laughs> hairline, hairline, but no, sort of a, a black on the surface. coverage just mm. there. Okay, well, that's great. Let's take, do... take the specs off and yeah. there you are. Okay, let's I see. Think motivate. your will reborn. <laughs> well, let's hope so. So let me say, you said something at the beginning, and I, I, what was the last Shakespeare play that you directed? I directed A Midsummer Night's That's what I just, the, this poetry in this is well, beautiful, because it occurred to me when I, at the beginning of this dialogue, that the very first play that you saw that excited you was A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I knew the very last Shakespeare play you directed was A Midsummer Night's Dream. I just partly, can't think of anything more poetic than that. It was partly accidental that, that uh, I was going to do a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream and, and a, a genius colleague of mine called Peter Brook, I finally persuaded to, to come and do a show at the RSC and I said, what's it to be? And he said, well, what I really, mm. really would love to do is A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I heard myself say, oh, yeah, wow, <laughs> that would be wonderful. Forget my... Mm -hmm. um, and of course, he did a production so famous that nobody wanted to do the play for the next 25 mm. years. Um, so it was sort of accidental that it came late, but um, I then realized if I can do all 37, I should do it last of all. And not only that, I contacted the theater in my hometown Mounted. and they were very, very thrilled. So I was able to go back to my hometown and I did my final wow. Shakespeare in the place well, where now, I saw I've my first your, Shakespeare. Your early life was theatrical. You've it's clear that you you weave theater into your life, and it's been a wonderful <clears throat> it's been wonderful to have a small scene in well, the play that is your life. W w William Shakespeare actually wrote those words in King Lear: "The wheel has come I'm, full circle. Come. I am here, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and let's thanks again. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you so much." <laughs> The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, Gus and Luke Holwerda, and Rob Zepps. Audio by Thomas Amison. Edited by Evan Diamond. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.